Thursday night at 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary. If you can come early, we have dinner at 6 o'clock uh, and then worship and Bible study at 7. Again, Leviticus 26 and 27 this week. But today we are in Romans chapter 2. Uh, we're also going to look at a passage in 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel tra- chapter 12, if you'd like to find that in your Bible now, so you can turn there quickly when the time comes. 2 Samuel chapter 12, Romans chapter 2. Uh, we'll also look at Revelation chapter 20. But that should be pretty easy to find, right? You just go to maps and then you go back to the, a little bit to the left, and there it is. So... Let's stand together as I read the word for us this morning. Romans chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. It says, Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance and doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. For as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Lord, we thank you for your word today. And as always, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to your word today. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would be upon me to teach your word today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So in this section of Romans, Paul is showing us that everyone needs the gospel. Everyone needs the gospel. And and Paul begins by demonstrating that no one is righteous on their own. That's why everybody needs the gospel, because no one is righteous on their own. On their own. Every person is condemned by their sin. Every person is guilty before God God's, and deserves God's judgment. Every person uh, is under God's wrath apart from Jesus Christ. Paul will conclude this section in chapter 3 by saying, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who does good, no, not one. All the world is guilty before God. In chapter 3, verse 23, Paul will declare, all have sinned and fall short. And so before Paul gives us the the good news of the gospel, he's giving us the bad news concerning our unrighteousness. And we need to understand the bad news first to appreciate the good news. We need to understand that we are unrighteous before we can appreciate and receive the gospel and the righteousness that comes through the gospel. If You look back at uh, chapter one, verse 18. Paul said that through faith in the gospel, we are made righteous in God's sight. He said in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. The gospel tells us how to be righteous 
in God's sight. And so we have to first understand our need for the righteousness that God gives us through the gospel. And so Paul is showing us here. And he goes through this really systematically showing that we're all unrighteous in God's sight. At the end of chapter one that we looked at last Sunday, Paul showed that the ungodly person is under God's wrath. The ungodly person. Paul also showed that the ungodly are characterized by uh, by sin, very grievous sins. In fact, he, he gave us a list of some of the sins that characterize the ungodly back in chapter one, verses twenty nine to thirty one. Uh, they, they are uh, the ungodly are unrighteous. The ungodly are under God's wrath, and so they need the gospel of Jesus Christ to make them righteous and God's sight. Next, in chapter 2, Paul addresses the moral person. The moral person, or what we would call today, the good person. The good person. M many people we know would describe themselves as a good person. Well, I'm, I'm a good person. And, and they, they would say things like, I'm a good person. Well, I try to live a decent life. I try to do what's right. I try to... Uh, show kindness to others. The moral person or the good person would not identify themselves with the ungodly described in chapter 1. The good person might even say, I'm not anything like the ungodly people described in chapter 1. My life is not filled with unrighteousness. I've never murdered anyone. I'm not a violent person. I'm not sexually immoral like those described in chapter 1. I'm not like the ungodly in chapter 1 at all. And the good person might completely agree with Paul's assessment of the ungodly in chapter 1. The good person might say the people described in chapter 1, well, they deserve the wrath of God. Look how immoral they are. They deserve to be abandoned by God. Look at how they're living. They deserve God's judgment. It's right for God to judge people like that. They're bad people. I'm a good person. I'm not like them. So the good person might even give a hearty amen to everything that Paul said in chapter 1 about the ungodly. Amen, Paul. Preach it, Paul. Right on, Paul. Well, now in chapter 2, Paul turns his attention to the moral person, to the good person. So this good person, this moral person, they're, they're, they're not a believer, they're not a Christian, but they are a good moral person who lives a moral life. And Paul says the moral person is also without excuse. Just like the ungodly in chapter 1 is without excuse, the moral person or the good person is also without excuse. Look at verse 1. Therefore, you are inexcusable, without excuse. O oh man, whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. The immoral, or the, I'm sorry, the moral person is actually just as bad as the ungodly person. The good person, the moral person, is also under God's wrath like the ungodly. They're unrighteous in God's sight. They deserve God's judgment. The good person is no better than the ungodly person. Look again at what Paul says in verse 1. He says, you are inexcusable. You are without excuse, O man, whoever you are who judge, who judge another for their sin. That word judge there, it means to condemn to condemn. And so the moral person described in chapter two condemns the ungodly described in chapter one. He condemns them for their sin. The moral person says what they're doing is wrong. It's sinful. It's immoral. They deserve God's judgment. They condemn the ungodly for their sins. And Paul says, whenever you condemn another person for their sin, you are condemning yourself also. You're condemning yourself also because by condemning others for their sins, you show that you know that there's a moral standard of right and wrong. You're holding that other person to a moral standard. You're demonstrating 
that you know there is a moral standard of right and wrong. You are demonstrating that you have the law of God written on your heart and you're a, you're aware of God's righteous standard. And you know when something's wrong and that's what you're pointing out. Their behavior is wrong. And so you obviously know that there is a standard. And so when you condemn others for their sin, you're indicting yourself. Because you're not applying that same moral standard to your own behavior. It's interesting how, uh, you know, we will condemn a person's sin when we see that sin in another person. But you just change the circumstances just slightly and we accept that same sin in our own lives. It's essentially the same sin. But we'll, we'll, we'll make a pass for us, but we condemn the other person for doing essentially the same thing. This is what happened with David. If you want to turn with me over to 2 Samuel chapter 12, I'll show you the example of this in David's life. 2 Samuel chapter 12. Now, you probably remember the story of David. David committed adultery with Bathsheba, got her pregnant, another man's wife, and then he arranged for uh, the the death of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, having him set up to be killed in a battle. So David essentially had Uriah murdered so that he could then take Bathsheba as his own wife and, and make himself look like this, you know, uh, hero uh, who marries this widow of a war hero and takes her as his wife. Uh, and then Nathan the prophet confronts David about his sin. And the way that Nathan the prophet confronts David is by telling David a story about a man. And David thinks it's a, it's a true story. It's a real story about a real man uh, who was a poor man and he had one little lamb and he loved this little lamb with all of his heart. But then there was this mean, evil, rich man who had many sheep, but this rich man came and he took the poor man's one lamb from him by force and cooked that lamb and served it at a party. Instead of just using one of his own sheep that he had plenty of, he takes the one lamb this guy owned from him uh, and, and takes it from him and serves it uh, for dinner at a party. And David is completely outraged by this story. Again, he thinks he's talking about a real event that really happened. And David, as the king, is outraged that somebody would steal something so precious uh, that belongs to someone else and take it for themselves. And so David is confronted by Nathan. And when Nathan shares this story in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 5, it says David's anger was greatly aroused against the man and said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. That guy should be put to death for doing that. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And then Nathan said to David, you're the man. David, I'm talking about you. You did this, David. And thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have given you so much more. And why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. David, you're the guy I'm talking about. David, you did this. So David, by getting uh, angry at this story of the man stealing another man's little lamb for himself, David shows that he knew there was a moral standard. He, he knew that that behavior was wrong. And yet David was not living by that moral standard himself in his own conduct. Someone else violating that moral standard made David angry. And David wanted to exact the most severe punishment uh, when he thought it was someone else doing it, even going beyond the requirement of the law and saying, that man shall surely die for stealing his lamb. That guy should be put to death for doing that and restore fourfold for the lamb. David was outraged that someone broke the moral standard. But David was guilty of breaking that same moral standard to an even greater degree. Because he stole a man's wife. He didn't steal a man's lamb. 
He stole a man's wife and he committed the same sin, but his sin was far worse. You know, over in Matthew chapter seven, Matthew chapter seven, Jesus says there. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye? But you do not consider the plank in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look, a plank is in your own eye. You hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. We can be so bothered by the speck in someone else's eye. Well, we have this two by four in our own eye. And we see that speck in their eye. Look at that speck. Why don't they do something about that speck? They need to get that speck out of their eye. And the whole time we've got this two by four that we just ignore, that we act like isn't there. And Jesus says, deal with the two by four in your own eye first. We can be guilty of the same sins that we see in other people's lives that we condemn. And we can condemn people for the sins that they have when we have those same sins in our own lives and we just overlook our own sin. We don't see our own sinfulness. And that's kind of the point that Paul makes in Romans chapter one or Romans chapter two, in the second half of verse one. Go back to Romans chapter two, verse one, the second half. He says, you who judge practice the same things. The, the moral person or the good person may condemn the ungodly person for their sin, but they just overlook their own sin. They don't see their own sinfulness. They don't realize that they are just as bad as that ungodly person that they're condemning. The moral person practices, practices the same things as the ungodly person. The ungodly person you know, we were told in chapter one, suppresses the truth that God has revealed. So does the moral person. They're just suppressing different parts of the truth. Where the ungodly person is suppressing all the truth that God has revealed. The moral person, the good person, is just selectively suppressing parts of the truth. They practice the same things. You know, some of you work in jobs that require a security clearance. Uh, so you have to live a moral life. And you work with people that are very moral people outwardly. They have to be moral to keep their security clearance. And so they're moral outwardly. The moral person's sins may not be as obvious as the ungodly person's sins. Because the ungodly person's sins are outward, they're external, you can see them. The moral person's sins may not be as overt as the ungodly person's sins. You know, you can look at, you know, often you can look at uh, an ungodly person, you can look at their life and how they're living, their lifestyle, and you say, yeah, they're a sinner. <laughs> look what they're doing. Yeah, that, that guy's definitely a sinner. It's obvious. The moral person is also a sinner. But the moral person's sin is hidden. It's internal sin. In Matthew chapter 23, Matthew chapter 23, Jesus said this of the of the religious leaders. He said, um, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men. But inside, you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Outwardly, you appear righteous. Outwardly, you're moral. Outwardly, you're a good person. But you have all the sin on the inside. The ungodly person in chapter one, all of their sin is on the outside and the inside. You can see it in their life. It's obvious. For the moral person, it's all on the inside. It's hidden. It's not as obvious. If you look back in chapter 1, look back in chapter 1 at verses 29 to 31, Paul gave us a list of sins uh, that, that are practiced by the, the ungodly person. The, the moral person, the, the good person, 
is not practicing those same sins, at least not all of them. The moral person, for example, if you look at that list, a moral person uh, is, is likely not practicing sexual immorality. They're, they're not hooking up with a different person every weekend. The moral person uh, is, is not murdering people. You know, they're not a serial killer. But look at the list. The moral person, the good person, may have the sin of covetousness. Covetousness is, a, is an internal sin. It's a hidden sin of the heart. Covetousness is in the list with murder and sexual immorality and violence and hating God. So a, a good person can covet something in their heart. A good person may have the sin of greed. Greed is another internal sin that's not easy to spot or maliciousness. Just be a malicious person or malicious in their thoughts or malicious in their attitude. The good person may have the sin of envy. Or they're envious of others. They're jealous of others. A good person may have the sin of deceit. Just be a deceitful person. A manipulator. Or whisperers, it says in my translation, uh, that's that's a gossiper. A moral person, a good person may have the sin of gossip. Or be a backbiter, a backstabber. The good person may have the sin of pride. That's in the list. Pride. Maybe be a proud person. A, a, a good person may think they are superior to others in some way. I'm not like the people in chapter one. I'm not like those ungodly people. Pride is a sin. The good person, verse 31, the, the, uh, the good person may be untrustworthy. That means someone who breaks their promises. Or unloving. Unloving is in the list. The same list with sexual immorality and murder and violence and hatred of God. A good person can be an unloving person. Or how about unforgiving? Unforgiving is in the list. Refusing to forgive someone. A good person can be unforgiving. Again, that's a hidden sin in the heart. Where they harbor unforgiveness in their heart and bitterness and hold a grudge against someone. Or unmerciful. So the moral person condemns the ungodly person for their sin, but the moral person practices the same things. They may not practice some of the more, you know, overt sins that are in this list, but they practice the sins that are more internal sins, the hidden sins of the heart, like envy and covetousness and greed and pride and unforgiveness and so on. Those are all sins, too. And God puts them all in the same list together. The moral person, the good person, believes God will judge the ungodly for their obvious excessive sinfulness. And God will overlook their own sins. Because in their opinion, their sin isn't that bad. Their sin isn't as grievous as the sins of the ungodly in chapter 1. Again, you talk to a moral person, a good person, they'll say to you, I'm, I'm a good person. I've never murdered anyone. What do they say? I'm not as bad as some of those other people. Look back at chapter 1, verse 18. Chapter 1, verse 18, which begins this whole uh, section here that we're in. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against, notice, all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. God's wrath is against all forms of ungodliness and unrighteousness. And all means all. Including the sins of the good person. Including the sins the good person thinks God will just overlook. Or God will excuse from his judgment. Because it's really not that bad of a sin. Especially compared to the sins of other people. Now look at verse 2. So now he's going to begin to talk about the judgment of God. And he says in verse 2. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice 
such things. The judgment of God is according to truth. God's judgment of sin will be according to truth. Well, who's true? I'm glad you asked. Psalm 96, verse 13. I'll read it to you. Psalm 96, 13. For he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. God will judge according to his truth. Not your truth and not my truth. His truth will be the standard of God's judgment. He will not use your standard of morality or my standard of morality or your standard of right and wrong or my standard of right and wrong or anyone's standard of right and wrong. He will use his own standard for judgment. His truth. You know, many, many people create kind of their own moral standard. That they live by. Their own moral standard. And, and so you hear people say things uh, like, well, I, I yes, I believe that drunkenness is wrong, but, you know, occasionally on my birthday. I go out with my friends and we might start doing shooters and I maybe get a little carried away, but that's on my birthday. But otherwise, drunkenness is wrong. What are you doing? You're creating your own standard of righteousness, your own standard of morality. Drunkenness is wrong, except on a speci special occasion. That's your own standard. That's not God's standard. Or, I, you know, I, I, I believe uh, uh, sexual immorality is, is wrong. Uh, I believe that people shouldn't be sleeping around. But I also believe if two people are in love and committed to one another in a relationship, well, then it's OK for them to sleep together before they're married. Or they're married in God's eyes. Have you heard that one before? You're setting your own standard. You're making your own standard, your own standard of morality, your own standard of of right and wrong. And God's not going to use your standard. He's not going to use my standard. He's going to use his own standard to judge people. He's going to judge according to his own standard of right and wrong. His truth that he has revealed in the Bible. And, and, and to come up with our own standard of righteousness, our own standard of morality and our own standard of right and wrong. We have to suppress the truth that God has revealed to us. To come up with that standard, just like the ungodly in chapter one, they suppress the truth. You have to suppress God's truth to come up with your own standard of morality. Now, look at verse two again. His judgment is against those who practice such things. Verse one established that the moral person practices these things. Verse three says, and do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of? Of God, do you think that you're going to escape God's judgment? Good person, because you're good. In your opinion, you're a good person. And so you're just going to escape God's judgment. There's no escaping God's judgment. His judgment is according to his truth. And there's no escaping his judgment. Now, the outwardly moral person. They believe they will escape God's judgment. And they're self-deceived. To believe that they will not be judged for their sin because their sin looks different than the sin of the ungodly. They're self-deceived. They don't grasp the depth of their own sinfulness. They don't understand they also are under the wrath of God for their ungodliness. Again, verse 3, do you think this, O oh man, is this what you think? You who judge those practicing such things, oh, that's bad. They shouldn't do that. That's wrong. And you're doing the same. Do you really think that you will escape the judgment of God? The only way any person, including the good person who's outwardly moral, the only way any person can escape God's judgment is through faith in Jesus Christ. Through his death and resurrection. That's what Paul is driving at in this section of, of Romans. Apart from Jesus Christ, no one will escape the judgment of God. Now, look what he says in verse four. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Do you despise or take lightly is the idea? Do you take lightly God's forbearance and long suffering? God's forbearance is God's 
uh, refraining from judgment, withholding his judgment, and God's long suffering is his enduring patience. And, and do you, good person, take lightly that God has withheld his judgment of sin and that God is patiently enduring with man? Right, and the good person may even say, what's God waiting for? Why doesn't he judge those sinners? Why doesn't he judge those ungodly people in chapter 1? Why is he putting off his judgment? Those people are ruining our country and ruining our culture, and, and he needs to just judge those people. What's he waiting for? He's waiting for you, good person. He's waiting for you to realize that you need to repent as well, that you're no better than them. Look what it says. God is forbearing his judgment so you can repent of your sins. He's giving people room to repent and trust Jesus Christ for salvation. You know, over in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is patiently withholding his judgment because he doesn't want anyone to perish in their sins and be condemned to hell. And his desire is that all people would come to repentance and faith in Christ. Now, now repentance is when you change your mind about yourself. Repentance is when you change your mind about yourself and the way that you're living and you turn from your sin and you turn to Jesus Christ for forgiveness and salvation. And, and for the good person, repentance would mean acknowledging that you're not good enough. That you're not good enough to be accepted by God, that you're under the wrath of God because of your ungodliness and you turn from trusting in your own goodness and your self-righteousness, and you turn to Christ for forgiveness and salvation, and you receive him as your Lord and, and Savior. And God, God is forbearing his judgment for good people to repent, and bad people, and religious people, as we'll see next week. Verse 5, look what it says now. But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. God's judgment is righteous. God's judgment is righteous. Speaking of the good person, the moral person, he speaks of their hardness of heart and their impenitent heart. You know, it can be difficult to convince a good person they need to repent. It can be difficult to convince a good person or a moral person that they will be condemned by God for their sin. Their hearts are stubborn. Their hearts are hard. And they refuse to change their minds about themselves. I'm a good person. What do you mean I need to repent? A moral person believes they are accepted by God on the basis of their goodness. Uh, again, the, the moral person, the good person thinks, I'm a good person. I always try to do what's right. I try to live a good life. I try to be respectful of others. I try to help others. I'm not out there robbing banks. I'm not out there, you know, burning buildings down. I'm not out there breaking the law. Why do I need to repent? You got murderers out there. You got abusers out there. You got thieves out there. They need to repent. But not me. I don't need to repent of anything. And sometimes a person who believes they are a good person is offended by the suggestion that they will be condemned by God if they don't repent. How dare you say that God will condemn me when there's so many evil people in the world? Are you telling me that God is going to send me to hell with murderers and thieves and criminals? Yes. And it's offensive. It's offensive to a good person or a moral, moral person. And what Paul says here, look again at the verse. 
because the good person refuses to change their mind and repent, he says they're actually treasuring up wrath in the day of wrath. They are stacking up greater and greater judgment and condemnation for the day of judgment. The final judgment, the great white throne judgment, as it's called in Revelation. Turn with me to Revelation 20 and we'll look at a description of this final judgment. Revelation chapter 20. Verse 11. Revelation 20, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. At the great white throne judgment, the earth and the heaven will disappear. There will be no place for anyone to hide. There's no escaping this judgment that is to come apart from Christ. And I saw the dead, small and great. It doesn't matter how great a person was in their, in their lifetime or how famous they were or how wealthy they were. Small and great will stand before God at the great white throne judgment. And books were open, plural, books were open. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged, notice, according to their works, by the things which were written in the books. Now, th this is not a judgment that the Christian is going to face. All of our sin was already judged on the cross. This is for the non-believer, the person who has not trusted Christ. They'll stand before the great white throne of God and they'll stand alone and books will be open. And they will be judged according to their works by the things which are written in the books. Apparently in those books are recorded all the works they've ever done. Everything they've ever done in their entire life. The Bible says every idle word. A person will have to give an account for every idle word, everything they've ever said. And they will have to give an account and a defense for every work and every word they've ever spoken. And the judgment of God will be according to truth. His truth. They're, they're not going to be able to talk their way out of it or weasel their way out of it. They're not going to be able to manipulate God. They're not going to be able to say, well, that's not exactly what I meant when I said that. You're taking that out of context. No, they're going to be judged according to truth. God's truth. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it and death and Hades or the grave delivered up the dead who were in them and they were judged each one according to his works. It's repeated according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the second death. Uh, you, you know, you die physically. Those who reject Christ will be cast into the lake of fire where they will be separated from God for all eternity and e experience eternal punishment in the lake of fire. That's the second death, being separated from God for all eternity. That's spiritual death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You get your name in the book of life by believing in Jesus Christ. And so going back to Romans, Paul says for the, for the good person who refuses to change their mind because their heart is hard and they're unrepentant, they are treasuring up wrath in the day of wrath. It's, a, it's almost like a, like a bank account. And every time the moral person hardens their heart to the truth, and refuses to change their mind and repent of their self-righteousness, they deposit more wrath into their account for the great white throne judgment. So verse 6, look what he says, Romans chapter 2, verse 6. Speaking of God's judgment, God will render to each one according to his deeds. According to his deeds. So what have we learned so far about God's judgment in this passage? God's judgment will be according to the truth, verse 2. There's no escaping God's judgment without Jesus Christ, verse 3. God is holding back his judgment so people have room to repent and turn to Christ by faith, verse 4. Anyone who hardens their heart and refuses to repent is heaping up wrath for the day of judgment, verse 5. 
And verse 6, God will judge people according to their deeds, according to their deeds, according to their works. Now, again, we're talking about God's judgment here. We're not talking about salvation. Salvation is not by works. Salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Faith is how we escape God's judgment, faith in Christ. But here we're talking about God's judgment. Those who will go through God's judgment at the great white throne judgment, they will be judged according to their deeds, according to their works. And so those who refuse God's free gift of salvation through Christ, they'll be judged at the great white throne judgment and the basis of their judgment will be their deeds. Their deeds. God will render each one according to their deeds. Now, please look up here for me for a moment and give me your attention. You don't want that. You don't want that. You do not want God to judge you on the basis of your deeds. On the basis of all of your works that you've ever done and all of the things that you have ever said. You don't want God to give you what you deserve on the basis of your deeds. No matter how good you may think you are. Isaiah 64, 6 says our righteousness is like filthy rags in God's sight. The best we can come up with. Is filthy rags. You don't want God to judge you on the basis of your deeds. You don't want God to give you justice. I want justice. I want what I deserve. No, you don't. You want God to judge you on the basis of mercy and on the uh, basis of his grace. You want God to give you what you don't deserve, not what you do deserve. You want God to give you what you don't deserve. That's grace. And John chapter 1, verse 17 says, By Jesus came grace and truth. The grace of God comes through Jesus Christ. John chapter 1, verse 14 says that Jesus is full of grace and truth. He's full of grace. But those that reject Christ will be judged by God according to their deeds. And what is he looking for? Well, verse 7 says eternal life. He's going to give eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. God will give eternal life to the person who patiently continues to do good, who does good continually, constantly, without interruption, who always seeks to glorify God, who always seeks to honor God, who, who seeks immortality, who has their affection set on eternity. There's only one person who fits that requirement, and that's Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only person who, who always did good, who always did the right thing, who always did the Father's will. Jesus even said, I always do the will of the Father. We sometimes do the Father's will, and we sometimes do our own will. Jesus always did the Father's will. He always sought to glorify and honor the Father. We sometimes seek to glorify and honor the Father, but sometimes we don't. Sometimes we seek to honor ourselves or glorify ourselves. Jesus was always mindful of eternity. We are sometimes mindful of eternity. Jesus is the only one who meets this criteria for eternal life. The rest of us fall woefully short. But through faith in Jesus Christ, his perfect righteousness is imputed to us. And so really, this is describing someone in verse seven. It's describing someone who is born again, a born again Christian who has trusted Christ and has had the righteousness of Christ imputed to them. The natural man, the unregenerate man doesn't fit this description at all. So verse eight, he goes on. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, they will receive indignation, wrath, tribulation, 
and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek of the Jew first because uh, the oracles of God came to the Jews first. The word of God came to the Jews. The prophets were sent to the Jews. Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. Salvation came to the Jews first and then it went to the non-Jews, the Greeks, the Gentiles. And so for those who reject the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, who do not obey the truth, as it says and in verse eight, they will experience everlasting judgment, indignation, wrath, tribulation and anguish. But glory, honor and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For the believer in Jesus Christ, we will experience everlasting glory, honor and peace. For there is no partiality with God. God will not give any person or group special treatment. There's no partiality with God. He, he's, he's not going to show partiality to, to anyone. He's, he's not going to exempt anyone because of who they are. Again, for the good person, the moral person who thinks, well, God's not going to judge my sins. He's going to excuse my sins. He's going to overlook my sins. No, he's not going to show any partiality to anyone. He's not going to say, you know what, you're, you're right. The people in chapter one, those are really bad people, but you're a good person. And yeah, you've got some sin, but we can just exempt you of judgment because, you know, you don't have to worry about. No, no, he's not going to show any kind of partiality. He says in verse 12, for as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law, those who do not have the law of God here, he's speaking of uh, of non-believers who don't have the law of God. They don't have the scriptures. They don't have the Bible. Uh, he says uh, those who do not have the law of God, who do not have the word, they will be judged according to the light that God has given them. What's the light that God has given to every person? Well, we saw that in chapter one. God reveals himself through creation. Everybody knows from creation that there is a God they can see in creation, his power, his nature, his character, his Godhead. And every person has God's moral law written on their heart and in their conscience. And so for those that don't have the law of God, they don't have the Bible. They've never heard of Jesus Christ. They will be judged according to the revelation of God. They do have the light they have been given. And every person violates that light. Every person violates that light. Every person is guilty. I mean, how many of you here, a show of hands, how many of you here have always obeyed your conscience? When your conscience told you not to do something, you always obeyed it. Go ahead, raise your hands. Anybody? Those watching online, no one raised their hand. Because we don't always obey our conscience. We're all guilty. So again, you know, sometimes people will bring up, what about the guy who lives in some remote place? They never hear of Jesus Christ. They've never heard the gospel. They don't have a Bible. They don't know the Ten Commandments. What happens to that person? Well, they've got creation. God is revealing himself through his creation. God has written his law on their heart. Have they obeyed? And the answer is no. They're guilty. Those who do have the law, those who do have the law of God, those who do have the word of God, well, they have more light. And so they will be judged by a higher standard. They will be judged according to the law that they have be have been given. You think about all the light that we have today. You know, you're sitting with a Bible in your lap. A, a full and complete revelation from God, Old Testament and New Testament. You own your own copy. You probably have several copies in your house and several different translations. So that it's easy for you to understand. You can come here to this church or to another church where you can hear the word of God taught week in, week out. You know, we've got Christian radio stations that are broadcasting Bible teaching 24 hours a day. You've got TV stations. You've got uh, the Internet. You've got apps and websites that you know, we just have all of this light available to us. And the more light you have. The more responsibility you have. The more knowledge comes more responsibility. We have we have more light available to us today than any previous generation in church 
history. And there's a responsibility that comes with that. We'll be judged according to the light God has given us. So verse 13, it's not the hearers of the law that are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. The word justified means declared righteous. God's going to declare those who are doers of the law righteous. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. God has written his moral law on every heart. And so even the person who doesn't have the Bible, doesn't have the Ten Commandments, they have this moral law from God written on their heart. And, and so when they obey that moral law, they are showing that they have this law written on their heart. They have a knowledge of right and wrong. That's why they're without excuse. And so finally, verse 16 and the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel for the for the good person, the moral person that is addressed in this section, whose sins are not outward and not obvious, whose sins are inward in the heart and hidden. Well, God will judge the secrets of men. God will judge the secrets of men. You know, back in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 14, it says, For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing. Every secret thing. So those secret sins that we talked about, pride, covetousness, jealousy. You know, Jesus talked about lust and anger. You know, if you're angry with your brother, you're guilty of murder. If you have lust in your heart, you're, you're guilty of adultery, all of those secret sins and all of those hidden sins will be brought into the light at the judgment day and people will be judged for the secret things. The moral person, the good person will not escape the judgment of God. Just because their sins are not outward, they're inward, they're not going to escape the judgment of God. The secret things of men, the hidden things will also be judged. And listen, there will be a lot of good people in hell. There will be a lot of good people in hell. There's a big, big difference between being good and being righteous in God's sight. A person can be a good person, but not righteous in God's sight. We, we, can, we can be good, moral, outwardly. But that doesn't mean that we are righteous in God's sight. We are declared righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ is the only way anyone will be pronounced righteous in God's sight. No one will get into heaven on the basis of their deeds or their works or how good they are or being a good person. It's only through faith in Jesus Christ. This is why Jesus Christ came. This is why he died on the cross and rose again to rescue us, to make us righteous in God's sight. This, this is what, what Paul is driving home and laying out for us in this section. We're all unrighteous. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's no one who is good enough. Not a single person. This is why we need the gospel. This is why we need the good news from God. Back in chapter 1, Back in chapter 1, verse 18, I'm sorry, verse 17. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, and it's from faith to faith. The way to be declared right with God is through faith in the gospel, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you, Jesus, that you have provided a way for us to be right and to be reconciled with the Father. We thank you, Jesus, that you came and you died on the cross for us, that you were buried and that you rose again. And through your death and resurrection, our sins are blotted out and removed. And we are declared righteous 
and God's sight. We thank you for that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to close with our benediction as we always do. So let's sing to the Lord today. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. And melt me, mold me, fill me, and use me. Hey, if you're here today, you need prayer for anything at all. There'll be men and women down front available to pray with you as we close out the service. If you're here, you've never trusted Christ for salvation. I want to invite you to do that today. Or if you've been trusting in your own goodness to get you into heaven, it's not going to get you into heaven. You need to trust Christ. And so if you haven't done that, I want to invite you to do that today as we close out the service. I want to invite you to come down front, talk to somebody on the prayer team, receive prayer before you go. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you this week and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen.